Ah, here we go. All right, so just let me know if this is uh, <laughs> if this is working okay. And uh, I've got uh, yeah, just let me know if yeah, it's back. All right. I see you. Uh, all right. So if anyone has any questions or comments, uh, I'm I'm wide open, baby. I'm like the Bay of Fundy. <laughs> Almost exactly like the Bay of Fundy. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, comments, uh, issues, uh, I'm happy to discuss whatever my oh yeah, overhead lights, oh so shiny forehead can help you. So somebody wrote, hey Steph, how would you respond to Jean uh, claim that an anarchic society is impossible because you cannot get people to respect any type of property rights without a state to enforce them? Okay, so if somebody made that argument to me, uh, I would feign appendicitis, no, um, appendicitis, diabetes, a sore tooth. Uh, hair loss. Ah, I wouldn't have to fake hair loss. So if somebody asked me that question, say, people, can't, people don't respect property rights without a state. Well, I would say that there's a, there's a contradiction. I mean, it's a clear contradiction um, because the state is a violation of property rights. And so what, we, what you're saying is people don't believe in property rights without a state, but the state is, is composed of and defined as a group of people who can violate property rights as will, uh, at will. So saying that the state, which is a violation of property rights, is a solution to a skepticism about property rights is, is invalid. <laughs> That's just a logic fail. Uh, and so um, I would just ask that person, you know, please rephrase your question with some level of intellectual consistency and try again. As an addendum, will you punch this fellow in the face? Uh, I would not. Uh, punch him in the face. Uh, occasionally, I may be tempted in that way, but no. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously. Yeah, so it is. Uh, it is uh, really funny that. Well, and this is what people do all the time: is they they will create a magical world of opposites. Right? I say, well, you need the state to enforce property rights. The state is a violation of property rights. I mean, you, George Orwell said once, you know, that, that this idea is so ludicrous it would take an intellectual to believe it, and. The idea that you are going to protect property rights by creating a monopoly of force that can violate property rights at will is mad. People ha it's like if, I, if, if, if from a blank slate perspective, I said, okay, we need to create an agency that is going to steal half of people's money in order to protect their right to own money. I mean, people would say, I, what? <laughs> but we've inherited this stuff, so it seems vaguely reasonable. Uh, but it's not. I mean, it's not, it's not at all rational. Uh, it's rolled down through the ages of culture, which means we have all this propaganda so that it doesn't look irrational to us. But I mean, do that space alien thing, come in to examine our social system, and it'd be like, oh my God, how do these people not brush their eyeballs and put visine in their teeth every morning? It makes no sense. Uh, Steph, the U.S. is getting scarily Muslim hating nationalism. How can we fight that? Well, I mean, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough question. And I've gone all the way around the baseball diamond as far as fighting the good fight goes. I mean, I used to be a little bit more aggressive and passionate and thump the table kind of stuff. But uh, as the years have gone by, I've realized that it's earlier than we think. <laughs> so, you know, anger's great uh, when you have a lot of people who get it. When you don't have a lot of people who get it, then you just look like you're ranting in Klingon and people want to, you know, shoot you with a tranquilizer. They don't understand. So as far as um, combating anti-Islamic, well, I mean, the first thing, of course, is to recognize that Islam and Christianity share the same Old Testament, and uh, Islam recognizes Jesus as a prophet and so on. So there's a lo lot that's in common. But um, Christians, there's a, there's a time dilation or a time differential in terms of uh, Islam versus Christianity. Islam has not gone through its reformation yet. Uh, Islam has not had a secular critique or semi-secular critique of the holy texts make its way through their society. And so, uh, I mean, I'm not talking you sort of average Western nice <laughs> Muslim next door. I'm sort of talking like the real hardcore people over in the Middle East and other places. Um, and so Islam has not gone through its reformation and therefore Islam is a long way from coming to a post-Christian uh, environment or sort of post-Reformation environment. So I think it's important to remind Christians that uh, Christians these days that they're not responsible for the Reformation. The Reformation was done hundreds of years ago by 
uh, others, and so they're the happy beneficiaries of other people's um, intelligence and, and virtue and courage and commitment and so on. And to remember that it's not a Muslim's fault he's born a Muslim. Uh, it's just the way he's brought up. Uh, it's the way it's, it's environment. And of course, everybody who's religious should feel if they look across the water and see a religion that is is not pleasing to them, then they should be very grateful that they weren't born under that religion, because then they'd be looking across the water saying, "Well, that religion is not pleasing to me," and so on. So I think that's that kind of humility. I think is really important and can help diffuse some of this kind of stuff. Among again, among people who are capable of reason. Let's see here. Uh, is the NAP the only thing that really matters, or do you think other concerns might be necessary for a in a libertarian world? Why and why not? Well, I mean, the NAP is theory and practice, right? Uh, the NAP in theory is obviously important. You do have to have a theory, I think, before you focus on a practice. But no, I mean, to switch from one drum called statism to the other drum called parenting, uh, it is much more important that uh, parents not yell at and not hit their children, not spank their children. It's much more important that parents do that than that they understand Murray Rothbard's work. Uh, it's much more important that, ch that p children are raised peacefully by socialists rather than hit by libertarians um, because the human brain changes so much under those kinds of stresses and fundamentally becomes almost incapable of reason down the road that um, uh, the NAP in practice in the family needs to be implemented, I think, before we can get any really consistent arguments for NAP or UPB or property rights across to the general population, because people are just growing up in general these days too traumatized, and too, you know, they're traumatized at home often, and then they're propagandized in school, and they're lectured to by priests, and then they come out without any capacity to reason, and very afraid of that incapacity, and that's why they're so volatile to deal with. So, you know, the, you don't have to understand libertarian estoppel approaches to uh, ethics and property and so on in order to say or to make the commitment to not aggress against your children that's necessary before anything else is going to happen intellectually I think yeah. I watched a four hour debate yesterday about anarchism versus minarchism the last question was basically how does one coexist in a state of society they were born into how do you get through the guilt you begin to answer and the audio fails towards the end um, have a look uh, on my website. The audio, I think, works on the podcast. And if it doesn't, then uh, email me with a question and I will uh, try to answer it in a, in a video. Now, that's my debate with Michael Badnarik. I would highly recommend it. It's called How Much Government is Necessary and I uh, really do appreciate Michael taking the time. And it was a very enjoyable debate. It's available on YouTube and on my website at freedomainradio.com. Uh, oh, hypocrisy. Well, okay, I mean, the base, sorry, hypocrisy, <laughs> that's quality broadcasting for you right there. The hypocrisy of living in a state of society. There is no hypocrisy for a freedom lover to live in a state of society. No hypocrisy whatsoever. Um, when you are in a situation, uh, hip virtue requires freedom. Once you have violence in the mix, there's no more capacity for virtue than there is for lovemaking when someone's being raped. Right. The moment somebody starts violently uh, aggressing against a woman sexually or a man, it's rape. Lovemaking has vanished. And as soon as you're in un you have guns pointed at you by the state, there's no such thing as hypocrisy. There are various survival strategies, and some choose to resist. I myself choose to pay taxes so that I continue doing what I'm doing. I have no problem with those who choose to resist. I hope they have no problem with those of us who choose to comply and take other approaches to it. But they're not right or wrong, in my opinion, and I'm not right or wrong. We're just both trying to survive uh, in a situation of predation, and there's no, no guilt. I mean, if we're going to start bringing moral judgments into the equation, then what we need to do is look at the people who are pointing the guns, not at the people who are dodging the bullets. So, no, there's no guilt. There's no hypocrisy. We didn't create the system. We didn't design it. We didn't approve it. We didn't support it. And uh, so we're not bound by what happens afterwards. I've seen other videos where you state, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you were originally influenced heavily by Ayn Rand. What moved you away from her philosophy, and what particulars do you believe she got right? Well, I, uh, I'm still hugely influenced by Ayn Rand, and uh, it would be impossible to be uninfluenced at this point by Ayn Rand. Um, 
I think, I mean, she was an incredible genius. I mean, I think that needs, to, people need to understand that first. I mean, this stone genius. And I mean, how many people have written some of the most popular and powerful works in a language that they didn't even learn until they were in their 20s? I mean, it's, it's amazing what she did when English isn't even her first language. Um, her plots, uh, her, her characters, they're vivid, they're powerful, they're electrifying. Uh, yeah, okay, there are problems. There are problems. I don't mean to brush them over. She was uh, a lit little into the hot, hot and heavy, dirty, nasty, <laughs> aggressive sex. But, um, uh, you know, maybe that's a matter of personal taste, but uh, I think that was a problem. Uh, she obviously got homosexuality wrong, but this is prior to the biology that came out um, certainly not too long after she died, perhaps even a little bit before. Uh, she was wrong about the state. Uh, I mean, it's these kinds of issues um, are really challenging because she knew it. She knew it. So in Galt's Gulch, there's no government. And then the first thing that they do when they're leaving Galt's Gulch at the end of Atlas Shrugged, spoiler alert, <laughs> is uh, they try to fix the Constitution to reinstate the government for everyone else. So in her ideal world, there was no government, but she was not able to make the leap to anarchism. I don't know if it's because she had personal animosities with anarchists. I don't know if she liked the attention of political people or wanted influence in that area, or if it was just too great a conceptual leap for her. But uh, there was no successful answering uh, if the non-initiation of force is the foundation of the objectivist philosophy, NAP and property rights, you can't have a government. You, you can't. I mean, I'm sorry, that just doesn't work because the government is the initiation still well voluntary taxation well if it's voluntary it's not taxation that's like consensual rape just uh, doesn't work and um, competing defense forces say so, well the government can have a monopoly on uh, police and law courts and military and what the objective is like well if they have a monopoly then they can initiate the use of force against competitors who are themselves peaceful which violates the NAP I mean it just doesn't and I try you know I spent years running myself around in circles and creating thought balloons sort of akin to my lower intestine, just trying to square this circle, and it can't be done. And then you just have to let go of it in a big whoosh. I mean, you just have to let go of it and say, hey, I'm down with her on the metaphysics. Fantastic. Reality, beautiful. Uh, epistemology, bang on. Ethics, very close, but have to go one step or two steps further. And um, politics, um, just don't see eye to eye. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I mean, to me, anybody who doesn't recognize that Ayn Rand was a genius is just themselves a fool. Um, it's one of my acid tests. Like if somebody just starts dissing Ayn Rand, uh, I mean, it's just like, oh man, you people, <laughs> you know, come on. Uh, I know that they're just repeating stuff. I know that they're second-handers because the way that people oppose Ayn Rand is they will take her more extreme statements, right? Like the Palestinians are animals and so on. They'll take her more extreme statements and, and bad statements, wrong statements, no question. And they'll parade those out. Or they'll say, well, Ayn Rand took Medicare and she took Social Security, so she's a hypocrite, therefore blah, 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 blah. They'll take all of this kind of stuff and what they won't actually do is address her arguments. And um, you have to work pretty hard to over... I mean, I think I'm a pretty smart fella. It took me like 20 years to find some way to extend and improve upon, as I think, <laughs> what Ayn Rand was doing. And so when I see people throwing rocks at a cliff, I don't think that they're mountain climbers. You know, people got to climb the mountain. Uh, you got to tackle her. Uh, and I, I mean, I learned this in grad school. I mean, y even if it's somebody whose ideas you dislike, you have to get into their skin. You have to get into their ideas. You have to tackle their ideas and, uh, you know, find their flaws. You can't just ad hominem. And that's all you see with Ayn Rand stuff. It's just ad hominem and argument by ad adjective and so on. So, so yeah, I would consider myself, uh, honestly, uh, in most particulars up to... Um, uh, ethics and, and philosophy, I'm still an almost complete objectivist, so uh, I just feel that the consistency is, you know, uh, what um, what's it? Aristotle said about Plato's theory of the forms, we must love the truth more than our friends, and um, hopefully our friends will love us for loving the truth more than them, and it will be a, uh, a happy jello-based orgy of truthiness. But uh, I had to love the truth more than objectivism as a, uh, a fixed uh, dogma, so, or a fixed scheme. Which, and, you know, I like to think that uh, if there was an afterlife, Ayn Rand would be uh, blowing smoke down, down the chimney and saying, good job, I think it's good. Or, you know, she probably sounds quite like, almost exactly like that. Uh, Steph, I'm concerned the drone war will escalate into a World War III global genocide with this economy. Thoughts? No, I, um, I don't feel that way. I don't feel that there's a World War III apocalypse coming. I don't feel that there are going to be those kinds of disasters. Um, I mean, the ruling classes have lasted 10,000 years, and they survived the Cold War when things looked a lot more dire. And um, 
They survived the Dark Ages. They survived the Black Death. They survived. They're surviving my podcast on the internet. Can you believe it? But um, no, they're they're not going to. You know, the idea that uh, it's an idea floating around among some libertarians and others, which is that uh, the rulers are trying to turn us into worker drones or bodies or whatever dead people. It's not the case. I mean, farmers want their cows to produce. And um, the, the next step, in, in my opinion, the next step is going to be a significant step towards freedom. The next step in the evolution of society is going to be a significant step towards freedom. Not because our rulers want us to be free or committed to any kind of freedom in principle, but because there's too many dependent cows. And when you have too many dependent cows, you've got to cull the herd. And cull the herd doesn't mean kill people or whatever, right? But um, they're going to turn on the old, and they're going to turn a little bit on the sick, certainly going to turn on the old. They're going to means test the hell out of Social Security. They're going to raise the retirement age. They're just going to turn on these people. Uh, you know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. You lay down with the state, you wake up with fleas. Well, I guess you lay down with fleas, you wake up with fleas. And so, yeah, they're going to turn on the dependent class. They're going to cut people off from welfare. They're going to turn on the teachers. They're going to screw the uh, public sector employees out of their pensions because they can, because they've got all the guns in the world. I mean, they'll obviously protect the police, the enforcers, and they'll protect the uh, courts, and they'll protect the prison guards because they need those as the enforcers. It's going to be a big step towards freedom, and I think it's, uh, you know, hopefully we can keep that momentum going. But it's sort of like in, in China, you know, they just, they got it. You know, communism ain't working. Okay, let's screw everyone who's communist and turn towards uh, the free market more. Same thing in, in Russia, same thing's happening in India. Uh, so the next step we're going to get is, you know, the, the dependent classes are going to get screwed. There's going to be greater liberty for others. There's going to be debt repudiation uh, because you can't go the inflation route anymore. And we're going to shake this off like a bad hangover. Uh, that's my opinion. I could be wrong. So, um, killer based orgy of crudiness. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they do come out right. You know, I, I, when I come up with metaphors, I'm sort of, they're coming out syllable by syllable, and I'm kind of watching them go by like a train coming out of my mouth. So, uh, sometimes they work and sometimes they derail. Uh, if you've got a chance, could you spend a few moments talking about Bitcoin and alternative currencies? Please take other questions before this one. Do we have other questions before this one? No. Um, I, I have some videos on Bitcoin, and so I would sort of refer you to those. I don't want to repeat myself more than absolutely necessary. Lord knows it's happened before. So. so let's see. How would you address Marxist and left anarchist claims that wage labor is slavery? Well, um, I would first ask them to define the terms. And uh, slavery, of course, is when you are directly physically owned and controlled by somebody else who has the legal right to use violence to keep you where he wants you to do, to, to, to keep you where he wants you to be, to get you to do what he wants you to do. Uh, he can initiate the use of force of, uh, against you at will for any disobeying of his commandments or any fleeing of his geographical location. Uh, so if we accept that as a rational definition of slavery, and you can be bought and sold like any other commodity and so on, then for people who say wage labor is slavery, then they're I mean, I don't know how to put this very nicely. They're idiots. They're propagandizing idiots. They're not being careful with the terms they use. Uh, they are uh, using uh, extremist hyperbolic language. Uh, they are muddying the waters. They're not putting any clear definitions forward. And I, you know, so either somebody, like I would ask them to define slavery. And once we agreed on that slavery definition, I would say, well, h how do you feel about getting paid a wage? relative to what we just defined. And to say, you know, come to think of it, that is kind of far apart. And if, if they said that, they'd say, okay, great, you know, that's, that's really honest of you, well done, uh, let's figure out how it's different. Well, of course, there's, you know, no initiation of force, the person can leave at any time, they're not bound by a geographical area, they're you know, blah, 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 right? I mean, it's just not, not slavery. It's an, it's an insult to slavery. It's an insult to slavery to call wage labor slavery, and of course, it's an insult to wage laborers as well. So if the person was able to see that it was not the same, Good. You know, we all make mistakes. We all get caught up in our own language sometimes. So fantastic. If they weren't, like if they doubled down and say, yeah, it is just like that. It'd be like, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I speak a language called truth and you're well versed in some other forked tongue. And so we really don't speak the same language. I, there's nothing that I can say really. Uh, I mean, wage labor is, is very simple to, to understand. Uh, wage labor is, um, is hiring a taxi. That's all it is. I mean, you can walk 20 blocks if you want. 
and that's pretty tiring. Or you can hire a cab and uh, you can get there much more quickly, but you have to pay the cab driver for owning the cab. That's, that's all wage slavery is. You can, uh, you can um, make a chair using a, a, a hammer and a, a chisel and an axe and, and cutting down the tree and you can make your own varnish and you can do all this and you can drive it to the store and sell it and I guess some people do that. Or you can say, I'm going to go to some guy who's got a factory that helps me make 20 chairs in the time that I could make five chairs by hand and I'm going to pay that person a portion of my profits for the rental of their machines which make me much more profitable. That's all it is. You are renting machines from the factory owner in order to make your wages higher. It's a win-win. It's a beautiful win-win. And to, this is, that's the cold wages. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and people who get those two things confused fundamentally are talking about bad experiences with their parents or early employers or priests or something. They're not talking any kind of rationality about the real economy of the world. Even now. I mean, even now. Ah, all right. Question. These are all too short for questions. Having employees is not a requirement for trade. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I can scrimp and save and open a factory. Uh, and then I can rent out that stuff. In the same way, I can scrimp and save and, and buy a cab, and then I can rent out that cab to other people to get them to go faster. You can walk if you want. You can build everything by hand. You're not, I mean, or you can go and rent machines and, and make more money. Do you see gold as a currency within five years? Oh, no. No, 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 no. No. No, my God. I mean... <laughs> fiat, fiat currency is that's the essence of power I mean uh, you, you can't you can't have uh, a, a you can't have a, a democracy you, you can't have a state without some sort of fiat currency or some sort of control over these things um, because you, you can't bribe people with their own money very if, if you're using gold then it's sort of like a zero-sum game, right? You, you bribe all these people and you take away from these people and these people are happy that they're being bribed and these people are really unhappy they're being stolen from. So they're going to get mad. So you gain 100 votes for bribing people, you lose 100 votes because you're stealing from people. If it's a zero-sum game, democracy doesn't work. So the only way that you can get democracy to work is you bribe these 100 people with inflated currency and nobody loses anything for a year or two and then when they do, it's so diffuse they can't connect it back to the original bribe uh, and they can blame the storekeepers for raising the prices and all that. I mean, it has to have all of this fog. Fiat currency is the ultimate foggy noose that goes around the neck of humanity. They're never going to give that up uh, in any, well, <laughs> in any conceivable future that I can think of. Uh, I mean, yes, long time down the road and so on, but um, certainly not in five years. I mean, there may be alternative currencies. There may be people working under the table for gold and so on, but there's just no way. And no, no one's going back on the gold standard. I mean, can you imagine trying to pay off what is it in the uh, U.S., $120, $150 trillion of unfunded liabilities? You, could never, you can't even pay that off with fiat currency, let alone gold. The moment you go to gold, you default on the debt. You can't pay Social Security. You can't pay uh, un the unemployment insurance. You can't pay uh, pensions for public sector workers, which are underfunded by tens and tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars. So, yeah, I mean, you just have a revolution right away. You can't do it. Uh, Steph, do you think the likes of seasteading will make a difference in the minds of the general public? Well, I hope so. I hope so. I mean, the moment they get a platform up, I'm, I'm going out. If I have to swim, uh, I really want to go and see what seasteading looks like. And um, I'm, I'm hoping uh, that... Uh, I mean, of course, people, you know, people go out there and maybe they'll start making drugs or whatever, and then illegal drugs, and then that's all you'll hear about. But it's my hope that um, it will have some effect uh, on the minds of people for sure. I think it's a very, very cool thing that they're doing. Do you at least admit that the present, this present situation is wage slavery? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by this present situation, and I'm not sure how you're defining wage slavery. Um, w what we have I in the modern world is, is two kinds of slavery. They're both related. Uh, the first is debt slavery, and the second is inflation slavery. Uh, debt slavery, of course, is when you run up gov government debt, which is then has to be paid or some managed somehow. By the uh, by, people who aren't even born yet. Obviously, that's completely and and and, and foully immoral. And um, you know, all these people who are concerned with the rights of the unborn. <laughs> I mean, abortion is a problem for sure, but I mean, it's a very small problem relative to the wage. Uh, sorry, the debt slavery. 
that the unborn are being sold into. So, yeah, so Vatican, get on it because you're all about economic growth and virtue. Uh, and in inflation slavery, of course, is where your time and your, your savings are just stolen from you through, de through the, um, the deflation of the value of your currency. Uh, so, but those are, state, those are things to do with the state. I mean, they're entirely the based on the state. You can't have intergenerational debt slavery without the state, and you can't have inflation without the state. Because if you had a private company that had issued a currency and started to inflate it, people would just dump that currency and go to a currency that was tied to some real value. Uh, and so, and, and why would people even invest in a fiat currency to begin with? Um, anyway, so, uh, or, or use it. They'd want it to be backed. So they, you just can't have these things without the state. So uh, I think wage slavery is, wage is the wrong word. Because it's wage is, is a free market term, right? And, uh, you know, monopoly inflation and government debt, these are all status terms. So when you start to talk about slavery, you're immediately talking about the state. Slavery was in, like, traditional, rural, 18th century slavery. Agricultural slavery was entirely enforced by the state. It could never have sustained itself in a free market. Once the state stopped catching slaves and bringing them back, slavery would have uh, ended uh, in a day or two. Uh, so whenever you're talking about slavery, you're talking about the state, and you can't bring terms like wage into it, because that's all free market stuff. All right. Oh, sorry. Um, Casey, in his latest conversation, essentially predicted the collapse of the dollar within two to three years. It would be great if you discussed that with him. It would be. And look, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm a, I'm a history grad podcaster in Canada. So if you're going to take financial information, for heaven's sakes, go to caseyresearch.com infinitely longer before you <laughs> come to freedominradio.com. Um, there's no question that the dollar in its current form, with its current valuation, in the current trends, simply cannot last. Simply can't even remotely last. Um, but that uh, the dollar is only going to collapse if the government does not turn on its dependent classes. And the government will turn on its dependent classes. I mean, they eviscerated the pensions of people uh, who had worked for 30 years or 40 years for the Communist Party in Russia. They just ripped those pensions right out. and dump them in the ocean. Um, the same thing is going to happen again. I mean, it's going to be brutal, and it is going to be a lesson into exactly why we should never get into these situations to begin with. I mean, the harder a drug is to stop, the less you really ever want to start it. And statism is a drug that is catastrophic to quit, which is why we should just never start it. Uh, but um, I, I think Doug may be underestimating the degree to which the government is simply going to turn on the dependent classes, and um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. So, Steph, do you like the idea Sorry. So, so, Steph, do you think the idea of exploitation is invalid? Is it impossible to exploit people? Can only the state do that? Can that not happen in the markets? Well, uh, that's a great question. And um, as it's such a great question, I fear we may be out of time. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's a great question. Exploitation, yes, of course exploitation can happen without the government. Um, I mean, exploitation to me is presenting the worse argument as the better and profiting thereby. I mean, that to me is, I mean, there's lots of different ways you can define it, but, you know, <laughs> to best serve my argument, <laughs> we'll do it this way. Uh, that to me is what exploitation is most fundamentally about. Uh, so, for instance, uh, I'm an atheist, and so when I look at uh, religion, what I see is uh, children who are told various things which have no scientific or physical or rational or philosophical proof, in fact, are quite denied explicitly by all these disciplines, uh, children are told things that are not true, and uh, they are then asked to pay for salvation from imaginary illnesses called sin uh, for the rest of their lives. That's exploitive. But does that involve the state? No. I don't think so. Um, I don't think that we'll get a free society while there's still a significant amount of religiosity around, because it just distorts people's thinking too much. Uh, it, just, it, 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 it harms their minds, in my, in my opinion, too much. So there's an exploitation. Um, you know, there will be people who, um, you know, promise uh, young, young gigolos who promise the, the, the sun, the moon, and the stars to elderly widow ladies in return for sexual favors and romance, and I'll marry you, and then take off with their money. That's exploitive, of course, uh, and that's not state-based and so on. Anyway, so I think exploitation can certainly happen without the state. Economic exploitation can certainly happen without the state. Um, I think that 
I mean, there's a philosophy which says, like, if you're in a deal with someone, you, you just you grind them down as much as you humanly can to get the best possible value for yourself out of that deal. Like, if the other person has to sell a house really quickly because there's a death in the family or they got divorced, then you can use that to shave off, you know, 20% of the value of what you're going to offer them and then blah, blah, blah. There is that philosophy. Um, I, I don't think that's really great. It's obviously not immoral, immoral, but I don't think it's really great. Um, there are people who are very insecure, and as a boss, you can either, you know, grind down their insecurities, sorry, you can either sustain their insecurities by being mean to them, which means they're less likely to ask for raises, less likely to, you know, want to compete with you for your job and so on. I think that's kind of exploitive, uh, and that doesn't involve the state. I think that as a boss, you should try and build up people's self-esteem to the point where they become more competent and better. Uh, so yeah, I think there's um, I think there's lots of ways in which people can be exploited um, with, without the state, um, and of course it's those area those areas of exploitation that we should really focus on. You know, pursuant to my earlier comments um, uh, about focusing on that which we can control rather than being drawn into abstractions about the Federal Reserve and things that we can't control, we should really control uh, the minimize the amount of exploitation that we commit, uh, oppose the exploitation that we see. Uh, because that raises, right, exploitation destroys cattle to cattle trust in the tax farm and we need to lean on each other a lot more if we're going to start to dismantle this hierarchy. Uh, since states originally emerged out of religiosity, could there be a chance that it is in go a government-less society where religion is still rampant that a new state could eventually emerge out of it? Uh, the Enlightenment was very skeptical towards religion, and I would argue that the American experiment emerged out of the Enlightenment, and the majority of the Founding Fathers were not Christians in the way that we understand them today. Uh, Benjamin Franklin ne <laughs> never darkened the door of a church, to most people's knowledge, and uh, there were lots of agnostics and, and uh, deists, uh, people who believe there's some God out there who doesn't really interfere. Uh, so it's not... See... <laughs> Philosophy, right, one of the basic philosophies of philosophy is it's not personal. It's not personal. I don't dislike religion. I don't dislike the state. I, it's not personal. It's not like I have an animosity towards the state or, or religion or other kinds of, of falsehoods. It's just false. I mean, it's just false doctrines. You know, these, not, these are not supported by science or reason or philosophy. The statism isn't. Uh, um, utilitarianism isn't, uh, Marxism isn't, uh, Keynesianism isn't, isn't, statism isn't, religiosity isn't. They're just not supported. And, you know, I invite people to come and debate me. I'm happy to debate anytime, anybody, anywhere uh, about these things because I want to be correct. So um, I don't oppose religion for any psychological reason. I don't oppose religion because... I don't like the smell of incense or because I want to be the guy in the funny hat. It's nothing to do with that. It's just these things aren't true and it's not personal to anyone or anything. And, and if I'm wrong, then people can correct me and then I will apologize and, and reform my ideas uh, around that which is true. But the reality is that uh, you know, these things are, are not true. So they have to be exposed as not true. Uh, what do you got here? trying to figure out a way to ask this. Do you have much trouble getting past people's religious beliefs when trying to explain statism? I realize there are many levels of beliefs here. I grew up in the Bible Belt and was very religious at a young age. It can be extremely difficult at times, even having experienced it myself. Of course, yeah. I mean, look, uh, I mean, I was born into uh, Christianity. Uh, I, I was in the church choir. I was in boarding school. I was went to church. God, it felt like every day. <laughs> we went to church all the time and you know I would go to church with my aunts and my uncles and my cousins and church 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 I mean I get it I mean my one of my very first books was a picture Bible and I went to Sunday school and so I understand that I really do I mean there's a lot of um, I and mean, I wish there was a nice there's a lot of indoctrination that goes on it, it has to be a lot of it because when things are just so not true and absurdly not true then there has to be a lot of indoctrination I mean you don't need a lot of indoctrination as a kid to like chocolate, right? <laughs> because it's innately like, you know, you don't need, I don't need to, to send my daughter to don't skin your knee school five times a week because she doesn't want to skin her knee because it's painful. Because, ah. So, um, 
it is very hard. It's very hard to overcome. Uh, and so I sympathize and I agree. It is, uh, you know, it's a difficult thing to change. But we have to pursue the truth. If we get, I mean, uh, for me, I'm like, I'm 100% or zero. I don't do this 20% thing. I don't 80%. I'm 100%. Like I've, I've said to myself, if I'm going to go for the truth, I'm going to go for the damn truth. And I'm not going to cut any corners and I'm not going to skirt any issues and I'm not going to, uh, you know, s sort of build uh, my roads around particularly sacred forests. I mean, I've, I'm either going to go full conformity and not offend people and have all of the nice ease of swimming with the current socially and getting along with everyone by going along with the flow, or I'm going to go full tilt boogie to truth. I wasn't going to go anywhere in between. So I hope that uh, helps a little bit. Stefan, off topic, but what do you think justice is? I actually have a podcast on justice called uh, The Superhero of Philosophy. Uh, you can check that out again. You can just do a search on my website and uh, you can find that. Hey, George, are we done? Uh, we've got an hour here. Um, <laughs> I don't want to blow over anyone else's time. Oh, time's been up for a few minutes. Okay, well, listen, I, I want to be respectful of everyone else's time. I'm sorry I lost a little track here, but um, I appreciate that. Um, go on as long as you like. Oh, that is a dangerous, dangerous thing to say to me, my friend. All right. Um, I went to Sunday school once. The priest told me that people of all other faiths were going to burn in hell for all eternity. My father was Protestant and my mother was Catholic. Yep, a priest told me, one of my parents was going to burn. I was eight. If that's not mental child abuse, I'll eat boots. Yes. <laughs>